Hi friends, I'm Nithi the Pharmacist and we are broadcasting live from the Food Church on North Carolina. Welcome to the United States of America podcast. This is episode one. I would like to thank you all for arriving and making time to hear what we are here sharing. This is our real and official American podcast. I'm your host, along with Justice Anna Von Reitz, who is the fiduciary of the United States of America. And we are also joined by our North Carolina ombudsman, Cynthia Pinkston, who will be working with our marshals at arms in this podcast. Those people will be identified as moderators in the chat every week when we are live. I would like everyone to know that we are at peace and we have been at peace since the Revolutionary War. We operate in love and light and have been usurped as have all the living men and women on earth. This world operates in a feudal system with three jurisdictions, the air, water, and land. We, living men and women, operate in the general jurisdiction as assigned to us by, by our creator. No man has the authority to rule over another under God's law, also known as natural law or karmic law. The feudal system is alive and well as evidenced by the current de facto government that enslaves humanity globally. The Vatican has jurisdiction over the air. The British crown has jurisdiction over the water. And we, the people, have jurisdiction over the land. This podcast is being launched today as a beacon of truth for those who seek it. America has been misrepresented by those who have usurped our government and held us all captured on our own land. This podcast with Justice Anna Von Reitz is being launched to document the truth for those who seek it today and into the future. We welcome all living men and women, and we greet you in the love and the light of our infinite creator. Please post your questions in the chat in all caps, and we will do our best to answer all the questions that we can each week. We trust you will be responsible and operate in kindness and do no harm in the chat. Remember to do unto others as you would like others to do unto you. Our moderators are instructed to follow a three strike system. Um, so strike one would be to remove your comment and put you in a timeout. Strike two would be to remove you from today's broadcast and strike three would be to block you from the podcast. We believe we all should be able to live and let live with honor. And with that, let us begin by first thanking Justice Anna Maria for her great work and the sacrifice her family has made for generations in order to carry this truth forward for this great moment in time. I believe Cynthia has something that she'd like to share. Hey guys. I just want to let you know, my husband was an evangelist to the continent of Africa. For the past 20 something years, we've been all over Africa. Anna's giving you a little piece of information of what takes place over there. He had vaccine injury. He lost his liver and a kidney. He's had a transplant. He had one life to give and he gave it all. And Anna and her family has given all of what they've got, their time, their marriage, their kids, their home. They've given unselfishly to all of us to get our freedom. And with that, I want to say thank you for the gift that you've given all of us. Without you, I would have no freedom. I yield. Anna, um, I'd love for you to please share with everyone the story of how James is the hereditary head of state. I think it's very important for people to know and understand who you are and what this great inheritance is that we are being offered. Well, um, it, it all began in France uh, many, 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 many years ago, uh, back in the dark ages, in fact when we um, first acquired a, um, a, a government that we would recognize as a government today. Um, we are, oh boy, where to even begin? Um, okay, go back to uh, the fact that there was already a claim established in England for the French king. The, uh, the people that populated Western Europe came across from east to west, and the French king had relatives who populated England, especially central England, 
uh, the kingdoms um, of Powys, the ancient kingdom of Powys, and um, the uh, what we would recognize as as the communities of um, southern England from Glastonbury in that area, Salisbury, all the way up to Somerset and beyond. So anyway, that entire uh, section of England in the middle was actually operated by French. <laughs> and it was from all of that that William of Normandy acquired a claim upon the British throne, which he exercised uh, nearly 500 years after the uh, establishment of that uh, dynasty in central England. And this then led to him uh, meeting with Edward the Confessor. Uh, and they agreed that upon Edward's death, uh, William of Normandy would become the new king. And that was agreed upon. But then when Edward died, the British... Um, uh, the British uh, caretakers of the realm, what would what would be the equivalent of the Privy Council today, uh, decided that they didn't want um, the uh, help of a, a French liege lord, uh, and they would rather have Harold, King Harold, as their king. So uh, the deal fell through, and that's what prompted the what's called the Norman Conquest in 1066, where William of Normandy gathered together his faithful French barons and they came across the English Channel and um, they basically conquered England. So um, this was a, a watershed moment in British history uh, brought forward by the French and the French claims uh, based on those central kingdoms which had been established in the Dark Ages. Now, um, when William the Conqueror died in 1087, he did something extraordinary. Prior to that, he had uh, established the Doomsday um, Survey, in which they basically went throughout England and they cataloged and uh, documented and took an inventory of virtually everything down to the last goat. And uh, they then, it, upon the uh, death of William the Conqueror, they enacted what was known as the Norman Settlement. And this was when, uh, as a result of William's will, the entirety of England was parceled up and given to the French barons who had come with William across the channel and conquered England. So now all of England is this patchwork of uh, bequests from the king to his loyal barons in England, granting them sovereignty in their own right. And basically he gave them the land and the soil that they'd conquered as their own little fiefdom. And he even went so far as to make sure that all of the barons who inherited a fiefdom also had holdings in the fiefdoms of other barons so that they were encouraged not to fight with each other. Okay, and his intention was, in doing this, was to make sure that there would never be another British monarchy. He intended fully intended that uh, his sons would not inherit a scrap of anything in England. And the reason was that he did not want a king of England to rise up and cause trouble for France again. And so strategically, he destroyed the possibility of a British monarchy by depriving his own sons of any land in England and by distributing all of the available land by survey to his barons and making them all petty kings. Okay, so suddenly instead of one king, 
you had what four dozen kings something like that um and that ended the possibility of there being a british monarch you could have a uh, you could have a leader among the kings selected by the kings but you couldn't have a single british monarch in control of the entirety of the, the country so um how did how did this all work around to to the present circumstance where we have someone pretending to be the queen or the king of england um it was done by a, a sort of an unholy alliance between uh william's grandson and um the pope and basically uh the pope worked out a deal with King John to uh, be the overseer of the church's commonwealth lands in England, which is what gave that particular family a foot back through the door uh, and gave them something to do in England uh, associated with land, albeit land that did not belong to them. And they gradually finagled their way back into a position of being not the king, but the king of kings, uh, meaning that they became the leader of all these various um, fiefdoms without, throughout England, and all of the various French barons eventually, then uh, to a greater or lesser extent, it gave their um, permission to set up a trust in 1689 that became the National Trust. Now, they're, they're, they were the donors of the National Trust, right? So that they still have control of the National Trust if they exercise it and if they are aware of the fact that they are donors of the National Trust and can remove their lands from the National Trust and regain control of the situation. But anyway, that, that's all the stuff that happened in England. As a result of what happened in England, we now had all these Frenchmen who were sovereigns in their own right. And one of the, the families, the Belchers, came to America in 1608 and began building Boston. So um, that's how the Belchers one came to America. Um, they uh, were very early uh, part of the uh, the early waves of, of uh, people who came here and colonized. And they were living, still living, in um, the Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut area when the revolution broke out. And their leader and um, the inheritor of the uh, estate, as it's it, said the uh, inheritor of the clan um, interest was a man named William Belcher, who was a colonel in the um, Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. Well, after all this stuff starts getting settled, um, there were certain things that were the conventions of the time that required you to have a sovereign in order to be able to uh, take part in international trade and commerce. And we didn't have a king. We didn't have a sovereign after the revolution. Um, and we didn't want one. We did not want to associate ourselves with, further associate ourselves with the British than we had to. We didn't want to uh, take, you know, be serfs for the French king or the Spanish king or any king. We, we wanted to be free and have our own sovereignty. So what was done is that William Belcher, who already had his sovereignty in his own right uh, as a result of the Norman conquest, stood as the um, sovereign for the new country. And that's how the um, Great Seal came to have the Belcher coat of arms represented 
uh, you know, this is part of, of the Bellshare um, coat of arms array. And that's how that happened. You can see it right there in the corner of uh, Cynthia's screen there, that that central shield with the stripes and, and the stars and the, the weird, all that stuff. That's all taken from the Belcher um, coat of arms array. Anyway, so he stood as the sovereign and therefore the hereditary head of state, right? And this is happening in, immediately in the, the aftermath of the Revolutionary War. Um, now, that was done so that we could take part in international trade and commerce, okay? So this is all happening at the international level. And there was really no reason that average people on the street would be concerned about this or even think about it. So it wasn't exactly common knowledge. That part of it was not you know, okay, so we have the right to take part in international trade and commerce. And, you know, we have our sovereignty declared, it's sovereignty in our own right. But instead of um, trying to extend that initial sovereignty in England to the entirety of, of this country or to the people, uh, because Frankly, the Bell shares never wanted to be sovereigns anyway, um, you know, for all that that implied. Uh, so William did the same thing that his illustrious ancestor did. He made everyone on this continent a sovereign in their own right and bequeathed everything to them. So... Um, all of the soldiers that took part in the uh, Continental Army who won the revolution and who were responsible for winning the revolution became sovereigns in their own right on their own parcels of land, wherever they held parcels of land in this country. So all the Continental Army uh, and Navy uh, people that, that fought in the revolution automatically became sovereigns in their own right. And anyone born on the land and soil of this country forever afterward became a sovereign in their own right. Wow. So um, there's really, you know, other than the hereditary attachment and, and the, you know, business of the uh, coat of arms array, everyone in this country was granted all the same uh, status and sovereignty and benefit as William the Conqueror bequeathed to his barons and which one of their barons subsequently handed on in the same way to all the people of this country. Wow. Anna, I'd like to stop you right there because I want everybody to feel the weight of that. Like, this is this this first episode for this podcast, Anna, is going to be part of our introduction on the on the new channel. So I, I think that was a big, huge piece. I, I have a question for you then in this regard. So because we, if we're born here, we are, we've, we've inherited this because we're born on the land and soil, even today. Right. Um, the, the fact that no one understands this and knows this, I think that's, that's problem number one, but, but at this moment, um, you have a lot of, you're trying to teach everybody about the truth. You know, that's, that's what I see. I see that you're trying to teach everybody the history that none of us know. And at the same time, there are many people who are trying to operate um, using some of the teachings that you have. And they're trying to use those teachings and operate still on this de facto level rather than follow the complete instruction that you have to uh, for people to uh, reclaim their status by saying, hello, I'm not dead. I'm not lost at sea. I'm alive. I'm right here. You know, um, you've created a process in which they can do that. 
people are taking it upon themselves to not necessarily follow all the way through and they're still um, riled up. They're angry. They're, um, you know, they're, they're feeling, they were, they're feeling violated and they feel that now that they know the truth, they should just be able to just be sovereign. And, but there's a little bit more to this because there's a, a procedure, correct? There's a procedure and, and there's a responsibility. Um, you, you don't walk into this thinking that, oh, I'm just going to exercise my rights and not even know what your rights and responsibilities are. And, and these people that are going out there and just sort of flinging themselves at things and misunderstanding the nature of it are endangering themselves and everybody else. Because there, there is a peaceable and logical and lawful and legal means to secure our position and enforce the constitutions and do everything else that we need to do. But we have to, you know, we have to stick by the rules. You know, we do have our guaranteed sovereignty. I don't know, um, Nishi, if it was obvious to your generation, but certainly in my generation, people were told that they had inherited their sovereignty. And yeah, they didn't tell us that. They had us pledge an allegiance to the flag. So, <laughs> you know. Well, um, we, we were given to understand that we had the sovereignty and the right. And this was, um, this was something that you, you didn't take for granted. This is something that you understood involved responsibility. You had a responsibility to participate in the government. Uh, mm -hmm. You had a responsibility to, to think about uh, issues related to the public good. Um, you know, you had an, a responsibility to oversee expenditures of the government. And you mean you were supposed to care, Anna? Is mm -hmm. that why, what it was? Was it, pardon me? Were you supposed to care? Yes, well, you were supposed to care because it was your stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you just uh, hand over responsibility for your stuff to a caretaker, um, well, then walk away and leave the caretaker in charge. What do you expect to happen over the course of 160 years? Right. Well, of course, the caretaker and the caretaker's progeny are going to take over, and you're going to be left sitting on the sidewalk. And that's pretty much what's happened here because people have not taken care of their own property and have not taken the responsibility for taking care of their own identity even. So, you know, we've been lulled into stupidity and, and also lulled into um, a, a, a mindset of, of both entitlement on one side and um, lack of responsibility on the other. Yes. The victimhood mentality is, is, I think, what you mean, right? The victimhood mentality where people right. feel like they're seeking someone to blame and or they, you know, they don't realize that, that they're they're not actually being responsible. Right. And a sovereign, if nothing else, has to be responsible. So right. if, you're, if you're going to take up the banner of your inheritance, you're going to have to be responsible to a far greater degree than you've ever been. You're going to have to um, take responsibility for your own life, first and foremost, you know, and, and determine your own code and your own life. And then you have to begin reaching out beyond that to connect to your community, your county, your state, your country, and your world. And this is something that a lot of people never even think about. They just yeah. live their lives, you know, nose down in, you know, Puxatawney, Pennsylvania, and they don't think about anything beyond that. They don't think about themselves in terms of their sovereignty. And, I am. And, you know, and I, I want to point out that a sovereign citizen is an oxymoron, and anybody who uses that expression is a moron by definition 
So um, we're not going to ever allow anyone to call us a sovereign citizen. And right. we're never going to use that as an expression ourselves because you cannot be a sovereign and a citizen at the same time. You're either acting in a sovereign capacity and taking the responsibility thereof, or you're acting as a citizen and owing an obligation to the government instead. It's the difference between being the employer and being the employee, right? So if you're a citizen, you're an employee or dependent of the government. And if you are a sovereign, as in this case, you are the employer of the government. Anna, yes. so last night you were talking about the courts and that we are now being recognized in the courts and to switch the courts to the territorial in order that they're recognizing us because that makes you get your sovereignty back. That also means you don't share in their debt. That also shows part of your freedom. I thought that last night was off the charts important. I yield. Well, it is important. Our, our relationship with our court system is very vital to how we live and what kind of rules we live under. Now, unfortunately, this entire country has been under military occupation since 1863. And the fact that we're being um, occupied by our own military forces has obscured the, the harsh reality of that. But it is a fact that remains that our actual government was never totally reconstruction and restored after the Civil War. And as a result, the military has retained control this entire time. Yeah. So um, when, when we are dealing with their courts, it's in a different jurisdiction than our courts. Our courts have general jurisdiction, meaning that they have control and, and oversight of air, land, and sea. All three that affect us are the responsibility of our courts. But our courts went dormant. Gradually, over a long period of time, from 1865 to 1965, 100 years, our courts were dormant. And they, they just kept disappearing. They'd, they'd be called into session and they'd disappear. They'd be called into session and they'd disappear. And um, as a result, uh, their courts took over in 1865 and began operating on the land, which is not something that's supposed to happen. But um, because of the situation, we wound up with uh, martial courts operating in civilian territory. And so as a result, uh, we've had this weird court system ever since 1865. May of 1865 is when it was instituted. Uh, there were 10 military districts set up in 11 Southern states. And instead of that just going away, it expanded until finally we had military districts covering all 50 states and we had military district courts operating in all 50 states. Mm. And um, these courts are improper in, in terms of any kind of um, normal civilian um, government scenario. Instead, what we need are all of our own assembly courts at the state level and federal courts at the federal level to administer these different jurisdictions uh, as uh, a part of a civilian government. And uh, we haven't had that. I mean, it was just recently, the last four years, that the um, civilian government was summoned to um, come into session. And now we're in the process of reestablishing our civilian courts. And we are already guaranteed our right and, and um, you know, this is already agreed that upon the reestablishment of the civilian courts, the, um, the military courts would back down and we would reestablish our um, general jurisdiction. 
So are you saying that is what you mean? You're saying that currently they have agreed. I just want to make it clear for everybody out there that at this red hot moment, you know, Justice Anna has already established that they get it. They know we are here. They have been put on notice and they understand that we are rising. Is that correct? Well, okay. What this happened? Okay, go back to May of 1865. They've set up these military districts, and within those military districts, they've set up district courts uh, that were under the uh, control of generals of a brigadier rank or above. Okay. Now, these generals went out, and they just they chose whoever had a background, and they put them in the court. And these were the famous carpetbagger courts. All these people came down from the north and uh, set up courts in the south and began uh, collecting war reparations from the southerners. And the, the purpose of those courts was to collect taxes and to collect war reparations from the southern population uh, that Britain was exacting from the southern plantation owners. Okay. So those courts are foreign. They've always been foreign. They've always been operating in a foreign jurisdiction. And this was recognized at the time that they were enacted. So in 1866, the Supreme Court of the Territorial Supreme Court um, was uh, faced with a decision about that, which under international law was already firmly established. And that was that they had to give ground to the civilian courts. And the, the name of that case is Ex Parte Milligan, decided in 1866, which agrees that when our civilian courts are um, reconstructed or reinstituted by the states, uh, then the, the maritime and um, martial courts have to stand down. All the district courts have to stand down and allow us to take control of our own people and our own property again. So that was already decided in 1866, but because the, the general populace was left ignorant, not fully informed about all of these nice little arrangements that were being made for us, uh, we didn't understand what was going on and didn't react as we should have to uh, correct the situation and make sure that our courts were fully staffed and up to snuff and all of the different um, states. So the districts became an overlay and the district courts became an overlay. Uh, if you look at the, the districts, you'll see that those military districts have different boundaries entirely and don't conform to any kind of state organizational structure. Hmm. So, hey, friends out there in YouTube land, everybody doesn't know what's going on here. Everyone doesn't know why what we're talking about. You know, for those of you who are just tuning in, y'all are like, what is this United States of America? Like, what is going on? You know, we encourage you to subscribe and to ring the bell and like and join us each week so you can learn and ask questions because we're so fortunate to have Justice Anna here answering questions directly for us, for we the people. Um, this is an official American site. Can you believe, Anna, we got to tell people? Hey, this is the real America. These are real Americans. Did you ever think you were going to live to see this day? Well, you know, I, I get a lot of people, they see this flag and they go, what's that flag? They don't know that every country has both a wartime and a peacetime flag. And, and this would probably be a, a, a good time to correct the slight misunderstanding here, Nishi. Um, we've been at peace since the War of 1812 ended in 1814. Okay. Um, okay. But this is the peacetime flag that we're flying. And that's appropriate for us because we have been at peace since 1814, right? It's our subcontractors, our employees, the British territorials who have been using our war flag and um, going around and, and creating all of these conflicts, mercenary conflicts all over the world. It's not us. And so 
we've grown up seeing the war flag almost exclusively. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pointing out to everyone, hey, the, the vast bulk of this country is at peace and has been at peace since 1814, but we are not uh, bringing forward our own government. We're not operating our states. We're not, um, we're not operating our government. And that's why the rest of the world has considered our government to be absent and in interregnum. So for, for in plain English, what this means is that we set up this store and we got these people work in the store and it's mm -hmm. our store. We own it. Right. And then we went on vacation and we just let the people run the store. And then we came back and we don't like how they're running the store. And we don't seem to know how to take the store back over again. You know, right. but, but we own it. We don't even know that we own it because mom and dad didn't tell us that we owned it. You know, well, <laughs> Grandma didn't tell us that we owned it. <laughs> it's been 160 years. And, you know, that's six generations have grown up not knowing even part of what they own and what their rights really are or what their responsibilities are. And unfortunately, until you take the responsibility and get organized and actually exercise your right, it doesn't mean anything. And, you know, I always try to. Um, give people a, a, an example. We have a, a, a property that we owned um, years and years ago that has a wonderful blueberry patch on it. So when we sold the property, we sold it with a, a grandfathered in clause that we could always come back and pick blueberries on that property. Okay, so I have the right legally to uh, access that blueberry patch and go up there and pick blueberries every summer. However, in order to exercise that right, I have to get organized. I have to put on my, my boots and my, I have to get my pail and I have to trudge up this mountainside and I have to actually go pick the blueberries, okay? And it's the same way with us and our government. We have the absolute right to run our government. We have a international and guaranteed uh, contractual right to, to come into session, as we have. We have a guaranteed right to our Republican form of government, right? Uh, we have uh, all these uh, stipulations in place, but we still have to do it. We still have to bring the states into session. We still have to operate the state assemblies. We still have to meet the, the overall definition of what a state assembly is and what it does. Uh, we still have to take responsibility for uh, our own behavior. Uh, we have to uh, live within the bounds that our, our forefathers provided for us until and unless we get organized and, and, and you know, make other decisions. But we have to first get organized and understand what we're heir to and how that works before we're in a position where we can go forward and, and, you know, update everything. If that makes sense to everybody. I, I hope this I is it's, uh, obvious. It's, it's like a daunting task. And, um, and um, one time you said to me and you, you said, you know, for a long time, it was just me and my husband in the tree outside that knew that, you know, he had inherited this. And it seemed so daunting, like, how are we going to make anybody believe that this is even true? And so, you know, this is what we're faced with. This is what I get. You know, they're like, OK, Neethi, we'll just be sitting over here watching you uh, over there and see if this is really real or true or not. And and, you know, then you have folks who are already in the assembly who have just been really reading about this only for maybe three years or something. And, you know. There's others of us who have been doing things for a lot longer who have experienced and felt the reality or that we know, you know, like you and I were talking, Anna, about, you know, the work of um, in India that Gandhi did. And I was telling you that there's a lot of young people right now who are being told that he was a fake and a phony. Because the British territorial government is back in bed with the current Indian government and they're trying to to overturn what Gandhi did for India. 
Yeah, the and, and you're, you're over here doing this work right now. You know what I've been thinking about since you said that to me this weekend? I've been going, I've been just really kind of uh, having a, an inner turmoil thinking like, my goodness, Anna is doing this and there's already people who are trying to undo everything that you're doing or move sideways or go left when you say to go right or whatever, or they're finding themselves in club fed because they're not actually listening to what you're saying. And, or they're making up their own rules or they're just kind of caught up in their own uh, thing. I want to kind of rein all those folks in and let them focus on what we're saying here that, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like, I don't think people really believe that this feudal system is real. And, and that's, I think what needs to happen first and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, it, it, they don't, I don't think they really believe that this is real, but yesterday you even said in the, um, in the thing that you were recording yesterday with Terry, you were like, you know, explain, I've, 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 I've been asking the same question. Does, did anybody else out there receive that there's presidents that have been knighted that are bending the knee to the queen, you know, or that we've had generals who have been, the, what does that even mean? I don't think any of these people get it. Like you can't be true to our nation and be sovereign and also be bending the knee to the queen like what is happening well there's always been uh subcontractors okay we have our american government and our american government contracted with other governments to provide certain services those services are what we refer to in terms of the enumerated powers I think most people have heard of power sharing agreements, right? Well, we shared certain powers out to other governments to provide certain services. The constitutions are service agreements. They're service contracts. And the, um, the services that the British territorial government was supposed to provide included, um, among other things, uh, that they would administer territorial property for us. So, for example, under the Northwest Ordinance, as the, uh, the new United States began to expand westward after the revolution, I think everybody knows that the very first step is that a territory is established, okay? And people go move into that territory. And while they are in territorial status, they are under the control of the British territorial government. Okay. So the, the military takes charge of the territory and people are moving into this new state, right? It's going to be a state. And when the population is sufficient, then the state is formed. Okay, so this is all under organic law. It's under the Northwest Ordinance. It's the way in which our founding fathers uh, declared that we would increase our territory and then include new states to the Union. Okay, so each and every state beyond the, the original 13 has been done by this same process the Northwest Ordinance. And first it becomes a territory and then it becomes a state, right? This has been the way since, you know, the 1790s. So um, when you're dealing with this whole issue of, of territory and state, you're dealing with two different governments. And the British territorial government has been responsible for that process. And the military has been the kind of the linchpin because there was also an element of the British military that continued after the revolution. And that was in the form of an agreement in the treaty process that the British king, the British monarch, would be our trustee on the high seas and navigable inland waterways. So the British king always had an interest in our Navy. And outside of our coastal waters, 
the British have been in command of our Navy. And that's something that people don't know. But that, that's always been the way it has been. And so there's always been an attachment there in the military to the British um, monarchy. And so um, that's how we wind up with that association. And it also extends to the Marine Corps. When the Marine Corps is on land, it's on land and under civilian control or supposed to be. But when it's at sea, on the high seas and navigable inland waterways, it's under the command of the Brits. And the way that this worked, you know, the reason that this was established that way is that after the Revolutionary War, uh, our commercial shipping was unguarded. We had virtually no Navy. And the Brits had the greatest Navy on earth at that time. And so uh, our commercial shipping was being torn apart by French and Italian and Spanish raiders. And uh, we didn't have any defense to get our, our commercial shipping across the pond to sell our agricultural products to the um, the new mills and, and industrial factories that were springing up all over Europe. And that made it impossible for us to sell our products, our agricultural and, and natural resource products to Europe. And so it was to everybody's benefit if our our commercial shipping could be protected by the British Navy. And the way that they did this was by making this agreement that the British King would be our trustee on the high seas and navigable inland waterways. And that's how they got their foot back in the door in terms of having a military interest in America. And it's always through the Navy and through the Marines. We have so many questions. Here's your question. I'm going to start it and throw them out there. The, I mean, we have people lining up asking questions everywhere. So here's we, what we want to do. So here's a question. We're talking about this ex parte Milligan. And I saw where some of the states have less than 20 people. Uh, they don't have their committees. They don't have anything. They've already put in their ex parte Milligan. You said it's an immature assembly because they don't have the other pillars stood up. Is there any danger for the other assembly people, if the ex parte Milligan and all the papers are filed and they don't have a chance to help hold court before December, January, somewhere way down the line, there's no committees, there's no clerks, there's no bailiffs, there's nothing stature. So here in North Carolina, we've done the handbooks, we're studying. We're beginning to bilk out our committees and we want to stand those up along with the rest of the pillars to have our our jural assembly complete and stand our courts up because we should have court within seven days it, after we put in our ex parte milligan and we've stood our courts up. So is there a danger to the people who prematurely do this? I yield. Well, in order to have a court, you have to have a, a body of jurors. You have to have a jury pool. Uh, you have to have your court officers elected. And that's basically all you need. No, you don't have to keep a schedule. Uh, you, can, you can just have a, a competent jury pool. And as long as you have a competent jury pool and you have your officers and, and you're set up to do this, you can do it. Now, does that mean that, that you can take general jurisdiction over everybody else? No, it does not. It means that the members of your assembly are standing under general jurisdiction and have inherited general jurisdiction powers. Okay. So if somebody comes into, uh, you know, somebody raids one of your assembly members, you can invoke those powers. You can present an indictment against them to the district attorney. And the district attorney has to, um, has to prosecute. And that's a new thing because they've gotten away with not prosecuting their own people for crimes against the, um, the population here. 
So yeah, there's an advantage in, in uh, declaring a, a court as soon as you possibly can, but it, you also have to understand the, the practical um, situation where if it's someone in your own assembly that's committed a crime against another assembly member, it's a presentment within your assembly. And if you have a crime that's been committed, say a violation of a constitutional guarantee against one of your members by one of the um, uh, district assembly members, let's put it that way, the foreign British territorial or municipal government members, then it's an indictment to their respective district attorneys. So we're on as an indictment to them. That's what you're saying, right? There are two kinds of of, um, of there are two basic issues for a, a for an assembly court. It's either in house, you know, among our own members, among our own Americans that are um, part of the assembly, or it's external, meaning it's a mm -hmm indictment against a foreign citizen. Mm. So if that and if that would have happened before they came back to the land and soil, then that makes it that's a different twist. So yeah, if 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 you there's there's no silver bullet. It's not retroactive. Right. Uh, so, even, so, so even if they did no harm as far as we're concerned in common law, um but they, they, the, what did you just call them? The district? <laughs> well, yeah, the district personnel, whether municipal district or ter British territorial district, they're foreigners. Right. Okay. If, if, so, they, if they, if they infringed upon the, upon one of our people prior, then it's, it's bigger. It's a different situation, correct? Well, it's the same thing of like kind, okay? It's it's the law of kinds in the Bible. Hmm. You know, uh, Spaniards and Irish don't live under the same law or government. And in the same way, we don't live under the same law or government as our employees who are here exercising delegated powers hmm. of ours, okay? So it's you can't just go across in a, a willy-nilly fashion. I, I explain it in terms of being a two-lane road, you know. We're going that way. They're coming this way. As long as everybody stays in their own lane, everything works. But you can't just willy-nilly be changing lanes. I got so, you. you know, you've grown up, uh, if you're an average American, you've grown up under a presumption that you are a federal citizen of one kind or another, and specifically a federal dual citizen, meaning that you've inherited both the responsible responsibilities of a British territorial citizen, as if you were in the military or a dependent of the military, and as a, um, a Roman Catholic uh, municipal citizen um, and, um, inherited all those obligations and responsibilities. So now all of a sudden you're waking up and going, oh, wait a minute. I'm not a citizen at all. I don't have an obligation to the government. I don't get a government paycheck. I'm not a government dependent. And so you're waking up and you're shaking that off and saying, you know, I'm an American. Thank you. And, you know, I'm going to run my own government. And uh, no, we're not absent. We simply weren't in session for a long time. But here we are. And we do know what we're doing. And, and we're acting within the law. And we're acting according to our rights and guarantees and treaties and everything else. So you really don't have anything to say about it. Thank you very much for your service. And now we are going to take over our own country and run it as we should. And that's, you know, basically what we're doing. Um, we, we've brought our government back into session for the first time in 160 years. Wow. Next question. Should our assemblies be leaning after their trustee notices and their geoengineering notices have been sent out? Absolutely. Why not? 
Okay. One, of the, one of the chief things that we have at our disposal as a means of enforcement are the, the different kinds of liens that we can bring against these corporations. You know, um, as corporations, they're subject to a lien process. There are common law liens. There are commercial liens. There, there are quite a array of different kinds of liens that we can apply. And now that we have our bank set up, we can monetize those liens and actually, you know, do something about it. Okay, next question. As we get our other pillars up and we get stationary and we're ready to put out the notices that our courts are ready to go into operation and we're ready to start having operation then we'll have presentments or indictments the two kinds that will come mm -hmm. at us and as we move to that next thing of standing everybody up we want to hold a couple of mock trials, make sure we understand. We've got the Brent Allen Winters book on that our justice is going to study. When we get ready, then we find someone. We've got all of your books. So we're studying those intensely because we don't want to be ignorant, nor look ignorant, nor get to something that's going to fall, or we're not going to to know what to do or how to do. So as Alaska and Arizona have stood theirs up and they're ready to hold court, has there been any of the assemblies that have actually had a live case at this point come forward? I yield. Yes, yes, we've decided many, many cases in Alaska, not, not in this, uh, not in this assembly venue that we had, but we've decided them prior, where we had a, um, a, a prior assembly at the federation level. So you see, we've, we've been in operation here for years. And so, but when it comes to putting your, your, um, your courts together, the nuts and bolts of it, it comes as a real shock to a lot of people that states operate at an international level and international law. So what, what you're doing when you're setting up your state courts is you're setting up an international law tribunal. Okay, so you're functioning in international law at the state level. At the county level, you're, you're functioning at national law. Okay, our forefathers set this up this way to prevent other countries being able to come in here and cause us trouble. The state is the international level and the county is the soil level. So the state deals with issues of land and sea and the county deals with issues of soil. Now, observe something. As you come into your state assembly, you're also populating your county assembly because you live in a county. Yeah. Okay, so you come in at the international level because that's where we were all cashiered away by the queen. Okay, so we come in at the state level, but we are automatically populating our counties as we do that. So, you know, say that, that I'm a Wisconsinite, born and bred, I come into my state assembly and I live in Jackson County. Okay, so there's two courts that are being populated at the same time. One is operating at an international level and one is operating at a national level. Okay, next question. Next question. I'm sorry. You wanna get that one? Anna, we're on the hour. so. Everybody, this first episode, we were doing a lot of introduction. In the future, we're not going to do that again. It's always going to be the questions, and we're going to do more of a rapid-fire Q&A. So I was trying to let you know, Anna, that we are on the hour. We can continue if you want to, 
but I don't want to keep asking you that every week. And, but as we're getting started, I didn't know if you want to offer grace, if you want to do any of that, this is up to you. Um, and then in the future, everybody, we will have a hard stop at two o'clock. So we will start at one and we will end at two. Um, what do you, what do you say, Miss? You know, what do you say? You know, whatever well, you say. Um, I think it's a good idea if we keep it to an hour and we go real rapid pace. Um, I did want to clear up one other thing. Yes. Uh, my pen name is Anna Von Wrights, which is a shortening of, of um, one of my ancestral family names, which is Von Reichenstein. I just shortened it uh, as a pen name. And my legal lawful name is Anna Maria Reisinger. Okay, that's how it was shortened. My actual name is huge and long, but they, when it came to public administration purposes, it was shortened to Anna Maria Reisinger. Okay, so if you're talking about me in terms of any kind of office, I'm operating as Anna Maria Reisinger. And yeah, okay, okay so it's, it's Justice Anna. Let's just leave it at that. But um, I, I wanted to explain that to people because, you know, people kind of go around, well, is she Anna Von Reitz or is she Anna? Yeah. And it's it's really just Anna Von Reitz as a pen name. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Uh, okay, everybody. So, you know, I love y'all so much. And, you know, Anna knows that I have I have no um, nothing to lose, nothing to gain here. Uh, we want everyone to just basically hear the truth. She knows that that is what this is for. It is for us to all be able to have all the clarification that we need. Um, and once once we get our, 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 you know, now that we have our feet flat, everybody understands what this is about. Everyone has a background about what's going on. Um, we're going to start moving at a much faster pace. And the Q&A is going to start going like that going forward. Um I need your questions in the chat. They need to be in all capitals and they need to be here on YouTube. Don't try to talk to us on Mattermost or any, by the way, I'm not anywhere on Mattermost. I had, I signed up on there and I removed myself immediately. I can't delete myself from there, but I'm not there. So I'm not looking at anything that's there. We're only going to go by the questions that are here in each episode in the chat. And that way, when someone asks a question, I can pop it up for Justice Anna to see it. She can see it and answer it. And we'll just kind of go like this. Right, we'll Anna? Try. We'll try. We're going to try. <laughs> because because um, because the answers are so long. And and Anna, if you can also help me out by letting me know that, that you've answered it, I don't want to interrupt you. And, you know, a lot of folks are thinking that I'm just talking over you when I'm not. I think that you're done. And then all of a sudden... I'm sorry. He'll give him the answer. We're going to get it right. We're going to get it right. We're just, we're just getting started, friends. We are just getting started. So okay. thank you so much, everyone. We will see you next Tuesday at one o'clock.